Sup, freaks? It's your boy, Marty Bent, here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. The immense pleasure of sitting down with Raheem Tagazadigan, who is the president of the Free Private Cities Project that is attempting to bring free private cities to individuals around the world. I love this conversation because it, it defines an actionable path via which we can get to more sovereign, autonomous cities that respect individuals and, and actually provide services that amounts to the amount that the, the individuals are paying for those services. It may sound a bit confusing the way I just described it. However, if you listen to the podcast, I think you're going to get it. You guys are going to love it. This rip was brought to you by our good friends at the motherfucking Cash App. Cash App, so you stack sets, send sets, receive sets, and sell sets, if you so please. We're saying sets, 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 because sets are the standard. There's 100 million sets in one whole Bitcoin. You don't want to buy a whole Bitcoin. You don't want to buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. You can stack whole sats instead cash app makes it extremely easy you can dca in the sats by daily weekly or bi-weekly you set it and forget it on top of that they have their boost program which allows you to get a personalized debit card that is accepted anywhere visa is accepted sometimes when you have certain boosts enabled you're going to get sats back with that other times you're just going to get cash back that you can then turn into sats cash app can also be your bank account they're offering account numbers and routing numbers so you get your paychecks direct deposited into the app so you can do that if you like. Go check out everything going on in the Cash App if you haven't already. And when you do so, make sure you use the code Stacking Sats. That's S T A C K I N G S A T S. When you download the app, you're going to get ten dollars, and they're still giving ten dollars to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. Woo! Woo! Owls Lacrosse. Not to be confused with that dirtbag Owl who showed up to Bitblock Boom, breaking the restraining order, the court ordered restraining order. And I have out on him. He's not supposed to be within 500 yards of, of your boy here. And he was much closer than that. It was very scary. I felt threatened. This room was also brought to you by our good friends at HODL, HODL. HODL, HODL is here to bring you freaks a lending platform. And they're leveraging Bitcoin's native properties to bring you this lending platform. And they're doing it in a way that enables users to access it with no KYC, no AML. It's available to U.S. clients, too, in the way they're... This is possible is because they're leveraging Bitcoin's native multi-sig properties to create a unique escrow account in which you hold one key or counterpolar, counterpolar, counterparty holds another key and HODL HODL holds a third key. You need two of the three keys to move the sats in the wallet, which represents the collateral for the stablecoin loan that you're going to get when you put the Bitcoin in there. Uh, the benefit of this is as somebody who is using sats as collateral to get some stablecoin liquidity, you want to know that your sats are going to be there uh, when you pay back that loan. You're going to get the, the Bitcoin back, and the, the real valuable thing there. And the way this setup allows you to do that is since you have one key in the two or three multi-sig setup, again, you're not going to be able to move the coins by yourself because that wouldn't make sense. However, you have visibility into the two or three multi-sig account, and that allows you to ensure that your sats are going to be there. When you pay back the loan, you're going to get them back. Go check it out. Go check it out. Lend.hodlhodl.com. L-E-N-D dot H-O-D-L. H-O-D-L dot com. And if you want to get... If you want to get um, some yield on your stable coins, you can enter the other side of that book. Put your stable coins up to be lent out. And the Bitcoiners using their Bitcoin as collateral will get you your stable coins back plus some interest. That's how you get the yield. Again, Lend.hodlhodl.com. This trip was also brought to you by good friends at Compass Mining. Compass Mining is here to get more individuals hashing to help distribute the ownership of hash rate amongst more individuals, therefore making Bitcoin a bit more distributed, a bit more robust, a bit more resilient. And the way they do this, you go to compassmining.io, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-M-I-N-I-N-G.io. You're going to see that they have mining models available for you. Pick a model, you have pricing, you buy the, the miner, you buy the ASIC, and then you can also pick a hosting facility with competitive electricity pricing Excuse me, uh, to plug that miner in. So you pick a miner, you pick a model, you pay for the miner, and Compass on the back end uh, lines you up with a hosting provider. If you want one, you don't need one. If you just want to buy miner, miners via Compass and have them sent directly to you so you can plug them in into a power source of your choice, you can certainly do that as well. Um, however, if you, you want to make it easy and you just want to leverage some of the hosting uh, partnerships they've lined up, you can do that as well. So go check all this out at compassmining.io, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-M-I-N-I-N-G 
Io. We have a special link in the show notes. Uh, if you guys are thinking about this and going to do it, if you use the link in the show notes, that helps us out a bit. Always appreciate that. Last but not least, this rip was brought to you by our good friends at Brains, the team behind Brains OS Plus and Slush Pool. Slush Pool had their big update earlier this summer, which includes ultra flexible payouts that can be either time based or threshold based, mining reward splitting for automatically distributing rewards to multiple wallets. And of course, it came with Dark Theme. People are loving it. I know we love it at Great American Mining. Meanwhile, the latest Brains OS Plus firmware updates include full support for the Antminer S17e and T17e, as well as some of the it comes with as well some significant improvements to the auto tuning for all x17 devices and it's available now at brains.com slash os slash plus that's brains with two eyes b-r-a-i-i-n-s dot com slash os slash plus important announcement brains os plus is compatible with any mining pool you don't need to mine to slush pool if you use the brains os plus firmware there's a lot of misconceptions out there you can point your hash at any pool that you want using brains os plus firmware I mean, that's not how you point the hash, but you get what I'm saying. However, if you do mine with slush pool while using the Brains OS Plus firmware, you're going to get 0% pool fees. So that's just something to think about there, a little big to get you pointing your hash at slush pool. However, you do not have to. Since network hash rate is still below all-time highs due to the China crackdown earlier this summer, now is a great time for miners to juice up their ASICs with auto-tuning firmware and stack even more sats. For those of you who do not know how this works, it's very interesting, and it mostly comes down to the silicon of the hashing chips. There are small variations in the silicon quality for every chip in an ASIC. Typically, stock firmwares that come with the machines treat the entire device as a uniform unit, sending the same frequencies and voltages through the hash boards. Brains OS Plus boost performance by experimenting with different frequencies and voltages on each individual chip to learn which chips are higher quality than others. Then it calibrates to send more work to the higher quality chips and less work to the lower quality ones. Efficiency gaining here. Trying to get you more sats for your hash. The end result of this per chip tuning is more hash and thus more sats per watt of power consumed. Currently supported devices are the Antminer S9, S9i, S9j, as well as the S17, S17+, Plus, S17 Pro, T17, T17+, Plus, and the ones just added, as mentioned before, the S17e and T17e. What's up? What's miners? Where are you? Apparently, they're next up, along with the S19s from Bitmain. Stay tuned, TM, for more updates on this firmware and slush pool. And check out Insights, that's I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S dot brains, B-R-A-I-I-N-S dot com for content stats, charts, and mining profitability tools to stay on top of everything happening in the mining industry. Go check them out. Go check out all these sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to you freaks for coming back. If you're liking the content, please like, subscribe, share, link, review, whatever it may take. It all goes a long way. As the price of Bitcoin rises, we want to make sure people are getting quality bitcoin content so we appreciate when you when you send new freaks our way love all y'all enjoy this episode with Raheem. you've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free if you talk about a fed just gone nuts all all the central banks going nuts so it's all acting like safe haven I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. You probably should be. What is up, freaks? It's your boy Marty Bent here on a lovely Tuesday morning sitting down uh, for a podcast that's been rescheduled, pushed back a week due to an emergency on my end. I'm very happy to be sitting down. It's Raheem. Tag is Adigan, uh, president of Free Private Cities, uh, a company that is attempting to bring what many Bitcoiners, I think, would deem as citadels to market. Is this how you would describe what Free Private Cities is? Yes, I, I mean, I, I like the citadel meme. A lot of people have different associations, maybe. <laughs> but I think in the essence, uh, that, that's what we try to do. That's, uh, it's, it's a concept that's been around. Obviously, it's been popular amongst Bitcoiners for, for quite some time, like going and creating a private city where you pay uh, for services and you're, everything's very transparent, right? You know exactly what you're going to get. You know the cost. You, you, you're buying services from a private company instead of uh, paying taxes to to leverage the, the state's monopoly on violence. Is that a 
correct. Right. So, so we are, we are not constructing castles, uh, just to be sure. Uh, we are trying to find refuges uh, in, in the world of today. So I rather have uh, free communities that are based on the values of the people that join voluntarily into the, these communities. And I think that's basically what, what the Citadel meme is about, is finding a refuge in a crazy world and some alternative uh, institutions or building alternative institutions uh, in the field of living together, cooperating. And I think that's the essence of Bitcoin, having an alternative infrastructure of cooperation. And I think that would be the best sense of the Citadel meme. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we try to do, right? Yeah, so let's jump into like, the... The first principles of why a free private city would be preferable to something like living in a city and paying taxes and depending on the state to provide services for you. So the the argument is that the state, again, you pay taxes and they, you let, you're able to be protected by their monopoly on violence to an extent. How does a free private city compete directly with the state? Uh, I'd say it's a more neutral and pragmatic argument. It's uh, not really about the end result uh, and it's not so much opposition uh, to state and governments, but uh, opposition to them being monopolies and cartels. And uh, so the most pragmatic argument is about lack of innovation. Uh, and uh, uh, we've seen in many fields what lack of innovation will do. You will have entrenched parties just uh, fulfilling their or satisfying their uh, hidden interests. Uh, uh, hidden behind uh, some legitimacy. Um, uh, so we think innovation can bring a lot of benefit to the field of people living together. And it's uh, uh, mainly an infrastructure question as well. It's, it's what's the best infrastructure for people to live together and more important than living together is cooperating uh, uh, in the field. And I think we've seen lots of development in the field where innovation could, co could operate in the digital sphere and in technology. And uh, uh, so we expect uh, to see a diversity of results uh, in that sphere once we open it up. And we don't want to make an ideological uh, argument there. It's uh, really we build up on what has been tried and uh, what is underestimated in its impact already. So there's been a lot of tremendous positive change already in our world. And it started with special uh, economic zones. Uh, and there are a few people know that there are already thousands of them all around the globe. Uh, and they've been tremendously important in, in shifting uh, Asia uh, and, and uh, uh, shifting Asian people out of poverty. Um, and uh, we, uh, we think that the potential hasn't been fulfilled yet because it's mainly focused on bringing uh, quick material progress, but not really the kind of uh, innovation that's necessary in, in the basic infrastructure of cooperation. So there's a lot of top down, uh, even North Korea has a special economic zone, uh, but of course they wouldn't want to have their model challenged. Uh, so it's just a ploy to attract investors. Uh, and we think that much more can be done on that basis. Uh, and more important that special economic zones were even special administrative zones like Hong Kong uh, and uh, Shenzhen. And then uh, basically that's, that was the example uh, with Singapore as well as a hub that, that led to China opening up, unfortunately, mostly in a top-down manner, but already uh, the impact is tremendous on the world and, and on global wealth. So let's further define these special economic zones and how, how you plan to build on them. Uh, obviously, you mentioned North Korea has one. So how do they vary from location to location? What are sort of the first principles behind uh, their, their reason for being? Mm -hmm. uh, most special economic zones are really like free ports. Uh, so they offer beneficial customs regimes, zero customs, lower taxes, uh, up to zero taxes, subsidies sometimes. Uh, so it's an effort to uh, somehow uh, have uh, zones where you can attract industry and you can attract investors. Uh, but what we figured out, most of those special economic zones aren't really working that well because it's not enough to just offer lower taxes uh, uh, if investors don't have the long-term trust in the stability uh, and the arrangements. Uh, and if it's not attractive for people really to settle down and work on long-term projects, uh, then that tends to be a short-term benefit where it just draws from the surrounding areas and, and uh, companies that are already there just relocate. Uh, but to attract uh, more uh, capital and more innovation, new technology to these places, you really need something more. Um, and that something more is... Uh, um, 
legal autonomy in a certain sense. So you have legal innovation. And uh, some places on the planet have realized that. It's uh, the Emirates, for example. Uh, of course, none of those are shining examples of a utopia, but they are example of what has been possible and what uh, the result has been. And that being tremendous, it, mean, it, tremendous. it means uh, going within one generation from a poor fishing village uh, to a global hub uh, um, with modern levels of wealth and technology, uh, if you're able to afford that, uh, of course, uh, uh, while living there. And what the Emirates did uh, was following a bit the example of Singapore and Hong Kong, where you have a mix of more British-inspired common law, civil law, commercial law uh, settings. So there's no Sharia in, in those uh, uh, free ports uh, uh, in the Emirates, uh, but uh, you have the... the um, um, kind of commercial law that's that's been established over centuries and, and makes it easier and have an easy framework uh, for even expats and, and foreign investors uh, to trust that their location is a good location to build uh, long-term businesses. Uh, uh, so a few places have been upfront in the development and we think it's still not enough. Uh, uh, we think there's much more innovation possible. Uh, and uh, so it's not a, a utopian scheme in any ways, trying to learn from what has been tried, uh, uh, what the results have been and how to improve uh, upon that. Uh, and uh, we're seeing a, a lot of uh, progress in that area uh, only within the last 10 years. And, 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 and the progress is increasing uh, and speeding up rapidly over the last years. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things. So one, the progress that can be made on what's been done to date is better aligning incentives and in, in trying to get stakeholders to to have a long term stake in in the success of these free private cities. Correct. Yes, that's part of that. And what's possible within the uh, structure of sovereign nation nation states that we have nowadays. Uh, and so it's building up on the special administrative uh, zones and then have a better incentive alignment, better structure and uh, uh, more space for innovation there. And uh, already, I mean, the first uh, projects in place that use a new uh, legal regime uh, or that grants more legal autonomy than even the Emirates uh, is in Honduras. That's the CETA project, uh, uh, still not perfect, but uh, progress uh, on the way. And we already have a few uh, special administrative zones uh, uh, operating there on the ground. And uh, uh, what we try to do with the foundation is uh, bring those examples uh, to, to other places, uh, uh, have them work as role models and uh, with any uh, new uh, trial, more or less, to improve uh, and learn from the past experiences. And so uh, right now there are negotiations with governments uh, out there to have that kind of autonomy um, and it's not a secession kind of it, autonomy. It's really improving up on special economic zones. So it's governments who are thinking about having special economic zones uh, are realizing more or less that they are not the first ones uh, to think about that and they have a hard time attracting investors. So usually it's developing countries or countries uh, which still have most of their potential in the future, uh, to put it in a positive way. Um, and uh, there is quite some openness. And the more practical examples there are, uh, the more openness there'll be to distinguish yourself uh, uh, as a country, as a location for this kind of long-term investment that brings the most benefit uh, uh, to the surrounding population. And, uh, and there you see that the difference is not just, you have, don't just have wealth relocate to there, but you have wealth emanating from those uh, uh, special administrative zones that are working well. And, and we've seen the example in, in Singapore and Hong Kong. We see the example in, in the micro nations of Europe, like Monaco. Uh, if you look around those destinations, you see they're like, like belts of wealth around them. Uh, so it's not that they are drawing from the regions, they are bringing more wealth to the region. So it's a win-win uh, solution uh, for the host country as well and for the population there. Yeah. It, it, it seems like it's got to be a tough conversation with the government. Like, hey, we need you to, to back up. And it's interesting that you can have these conversations in the first place and sort of come to the table and, and, and try to create these zones. What, what are they like? And like you said, obviously, the, the government's incentivized because it brings wealth, it brings capital. 
And then yeah. most importantly, towards the end there, you said wealth begins to emanate from these yes. zones, which is... It's all very pragmatic. So it's not at all ideological and it's not arguing about governments and how bad they are. It's uh, it's really a pragmatic conversation. And uh, it comes from the field of mining, I'd say. That's the most closely related one. And it's also the reason why the entrepreneur who started uh, the foundation uh, that I'm heading now, uh, Titus Gable, is a German uh, mining entrepreneur. So he knew the field of... Uh, in mining, you need... Uh, long-term leases from governments and of course the reasons are very pragmatic they need foreign capital uh, because it takes a lot of investment uh, to bring resources extract resources and bring them to the market and it needs a very long-term uh, view uh, in order to be profitable so you try to have a matchmaking uh, for pragmatic reasons to bring wealth uh, to a country which uh, if you have resources usually it means poverty <laughs> uh, so it's, it's really a hard space but some countries figure it out and uh, uh, of course a lot of mistakes are repeated but not every single mistake is repeated in every single place uh, so as the world is becoming more diverse the chances are opening up for uh, governments to learn from mistakes in the past and to learn from success models and role models from the past and try to, for pragmatic reasons, find the best solution uh, for their places. Uh, but uh, for now, it's, it's usually because they've exhausted a lot of other options. So, of course, it's poorer countries uh, that are the first and, and where it's easiest to have that kind of pragmatic conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you've mentioned Emirates, Singapore, uh, outside of those countries, where, where do you see this begin to pop up? And then how does it uh, how does it affect like uh, um, American? How does it affect like the United States? Like, do you, do you think it's they'll? Not the, it's not the Singapore of today or the Emirates of today. There was a role model of what's possible within the generation. Right. So it's Singapore and the Emirates back then when they were poor fishing villages, uh, more or less. Uh, and where no one would have imagined how fast uh, wealth can be attracted. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was a similar reason, I'd say. It's you become a, a global hub of cooperation of investment by offering a legal structure that is marginally better than what's surrounding uh, yourself. And uh, uh, so it's a very pragmatic structure. It's, it's mainly based on commercial law. And usually the negotiations with host countries are not about uh, criminal law, are not about... Uh, uh, like residency and, and sovereignty, anything uh, triggering ideas of, of sovereignty. Uh, it's, it's mainly about having places where you have independent uh, uh, juries, you have independent courts uh, as well, and uh, where in our model you have an operating company which has skin in the game, which is really kind of management where people put in the investment for the infrastructure necessary and reap the benefit of fees and mostly real estate, uh, uh, increase of value in real estate. Uh, and we've seen a lot of urban development, successful urban developments are have the best incentives in line if the benefit from the increase in value of real estate. And that's what we try to bring together here. So you don't necessarily need tax funding or debt funding to a large extent. We believe that it's possible build on private equity to really build the cities of the future uh, and uh, no one of us has a crystal ball and knows what the city of the future in 20 years and 50 years will look like uh, so it's best to have this entrepreneurial approach of, of trying things and whatever works scale it up use it as a model as a prototype uh, and that's the approach uh, we have to that so every new project will have its own operating company and will and that's one of the most important things we'll need to have contractual arrangements with all the settlers, uh, which are transparent, uh, which are agreed upon in, it, in advance, uh, and which state clearly uh, your rights and obligations. And then it's a two-sided bilateral contractual agreement. It's not top-down arrangement. It's not like there's a government and, and uh, uh, you are obliged to, to uh, live under these arbitrary circumstances we've been used to be living uh, uh, under, but it's a contractual arrangement where you have a service provider. And we think we, we can pin down that a lot of governance in the positive sense is basically providing services uh, uh, to the population and we want to have this exact this discipline of the market uh, where if the services you are provided with are not uh, at all what you've expected and the price is much higher than you expected to pay uh, of course there's arbitration 
uh, and that's built in in this model that uh, of course the operating company won't be the arbiter uh, in any conflicts that arise so we can use there's already there's al already something there it's not a utopia there's a whole world of private arbitration between international companies that's used a lot and we can make use of that infrastructure that's already there by of course stating in every contract that we use those international norms of arbitration there uh, whenever there's a conflict arising so it's not this kind of top down whenever you have a conflict with government it's a government is, that decides uh, who's at fault which of course are the worst incentives possible so is it fair to say or is it even make sense to say you're replacing politicians with board members who are subject to uh, the whims of the stakeholders in their private city and the the, the courts associated with that Oh, I'd rather like to say replace them with entrepreneurs and investors. Entrepreneurs, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, board members, I mean, you have the association with the large corporations. And uh, of course, a lot of those corporations nowadays, they live in a very distorted field. Uh, and it's, of course, it's a field of fiat finance that Bitcoin tries to replace. Uh, so it's not necessarily that kind of corporate structures that we try to emulate and uh, uh, where we are much more closely aligned with uh, people in the Bitcoin space. I think it's really about alternative institutions but not in a utopian way it's about building it's about uh, uh, having a, 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 um, an offer and a choice that you can voluntarily refuse if it's not working out uh, but uh, yeah not just replicating what's there not just having uh, like shareholding companies uh, uh, that are financed in a traditional way so in most of the interest we're seeing in particular for investments and so on are aligned with the bitcoin space i'd say because it's the best precedence of building an alternative institution that can be the infrastructure for cooperation uh, international cooperation yeah so more leveraging natural law theory and in, in, in court systems as opposed to like a corporate structure that makes a lot more sense uh, yeah and so how how did this these free private cities start how big are they how do they grow um do, do you go in buy a bunch of land and then if it's successful you're like all right we can chop this up later how, how does that work uh, it's a whole diversity. So there are two meanings to free private city. One is a concept, how you ideally go about it. And uh, of course, that hasn't been realized in any place. It's a gradual way. So it's a really question, what do you count as a free private city? How close is it to the perfect model? Of course, you're one side of a negotiation with a sovereign country. So hardly ever you have the perfect result, but you have good enough results. And the important thing is to have marginally better results uh, and thus opening up the space. And the second meaning of a free private city is just uh, whatever alternative arrangement of living together is found. And so we include intentional communities as well. And it's a space that's growing a lot. It's just people trying to figure out ways uh, of living together in an alternative way. And it's part of the Bitcoin Citadel space. It's part of the intentional community space, part of the special economic zones space uh, of uh, private uh, city foundations uh, space uh, and lots of people take take different approaches uh, so we are very open um, and, and neutral about that as a foundation we are not sure yet we have a preference for one approach which we call a free private city approach but uh, 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 there are other ways to go about uh, that as well and, and a lot of people just start with the land they buy or own and uh, start from there we think it's better to start with the legal framework and to figure out the best legal framework you can have and then bring in investment and then uh, choose to buy a land so we usually work with options for land not having bought it beforehand but having options that you can then uh, use to get the land uh, once you have the legal framework in space that really allows for innovation in governance and innovation in the legal structure um, uh, but there are very uh, lots of different approaches out there and and lots of initiatives so so the industry is very lively at the moment uh, and uh, we'll see what works out best. Uh, what is most advanced right now I'd say is the set of laws in Honduras. They are not perfect because, of course, Honduran government hasn't been perfect. And this is one of the reasons why Honduras uh, uh, is a space that really uh, a place on the planet really needs foreign investment and, and really has issues uh, uh, with uh, governance and governments. Uh, uh, but the city laws really allow for much more legal autonomy than any other special economic zones around there. So it has a lot of potential. 
And, but it took 10 years to get there uh, and still it's challenged and still, of course, you'll have opposition uh, with a lot of misunderstanding of what those laws entail and a lot of nationalist propaganda, I call it, about giving uh, land to gringos and so on. You'll always have that uh, once you have uh, development somewhere, uh, but already uh, uh, at least five serious contenders to uh, um Uh, zones to zones like that, so special administrative zones like that, and already buildings on the ground and people moving there. Um, and so that's already a, a role model to follow. We hope that the next installment uh, uh, in another country, at another place, will be even better uh, than that. But then, of course, uh, every place has its own unique selling proposition, and Honduras is a great place for people in the US, the same time zone. Uh, the island of Roatan, uh, where there are two or three of those zones, uh, is a beautiful location, a very safe location for Honduras, great diving and so on. So, of course, you try to find attractive locations as well, where it makes sense to have, to, where really uh, more development could be possible. It has been possible under the legal framework that was there before and with the level of, of the local level of corruption and problems uh, that you have. Yeah, that's awesome. And Like you said, business is booming. It seems like particularly over the last 18 months as more individuals are waking up to, hey, maybe federal government has a bit too much power. Uh, what is going yeah. on here? Are there other options? Uh, are you finding that to be confirmed with what you guys are doing? Like you know, People are just trying to be like, all right, we need, I need an alternative to this. Uh, definitely. And it's mostly one point. It's it's uh, not wanting to live under arbitrary rules. I mean, you can have different opinions about the whole COVID situations, but what uh, most freedom loving people really don't like that much is the arbitrariness uh, about it and, and really feeling so helpless uh, uh, because you never know what, what will be or what will be allowed the next week uh, from now. And uh, uh, so that's uh, really where, where this model comes in as an alternative. It's mostly removing that kind of unprofessional arbitrariness, uh, which isn't even in the interest of, of governance in, in, in the long term and having functional structures. Uh, uh, it's really mostly true politicians trying to save face uh, and a lot of bad incentives and a lot of how to deal with uncertainty where politics is really bad at because their game is, is faking certainty, is faking that there's someone who knows best and better than you and who, uh, who has a crystal ball more or less or uses science or experts, uh, uh, which doesn't make, make, make any sense because they're the most dynamic fields and we know from economics, but of course the same applies to biology uh, and so on. There just isn't that kind of certainty. So you need more trial and error. You need more diversity. Uh, and you need people really trying to figure out and bearing the consequences of their choices. And that's why I think it's, it's crucially important, not because we think that we'll have the better solution for every problem up there and, and not because we are better COVID experts uh, uh, than those imply, employed by government. So it's not really about that. It's much more pragmatic. It's, it's uh, uh, that we don't want to live in a situation where it's one size fits it's all rules uh, that will fail in the long run because there's not enough feedback. There's not much, enough learning going on. Uh, and, and that's worst about politics is people, even if they fail, they don't bear any consequences. Uh, and, and usually it just means that they are allowed to fail more uh, <laughs> because the more they fail, the more they legitimize Uh, their interventions, and we've seen it in many fields. We've seen it in, in education, uh, in health, uh, in, in foreign interventions, uh, military interventions, uh, uh, which is more relevant for the US than, than for Europe. Uh, but still, it's, it's the same kind of intervention spirals that we see everywhere. It only seems to be getting more chaotic. And it's, it's gotten to a point of insanity like you said the arbitrariness the logical inconsistencies of everything and most importantly the complete misunderstanding by those in power that <laughs> you cannot control very complex systems like global economies from a in a top-down fashion which is truly frightening uh when you consider the last 18 months i mean you, it's quite possibly i think it's easy to say that the centralized coordination that we've experienced in the last 18 months is probably the most coordination the globe has ever seen at any scale at any point in history and you can't just turn a global economy it's not a light switch you can't turn it off and on and expect it to go back to normal the externalities 
that are going to emanate from the, the top-down decisions that were made over 2020 and 2021 are going to be written about in history books decades from now. Yeah. So definitely, it's it's never been as important as it is today to to have more diversity in governments and, and trying to figure out better ways. Uh, Mm. to deal with things and then uh, finance as important as it is i, I think it takes second place uh, uh, to debt but we i think we take a lot of optimism from the bitcoin story and and where it went and, and uh, without that i don't think that there would be a free private city project because it brings to people who are seeking alternative institutions and alternatives to what we are used to uh, it brings this kind of optimism and and that it's possible to build something and, and something may catch on and get a size where becomes relevant and then where there is no alternative uh, becomes untrue and obviously untrue. Mm -hmm. And so I know it, it varies from uh, location to location, economic zone to economic zone, but what are sort of the base services that you, or that the free private city model would recommend um, you start out when you're, when you're starting your own private city? Uh, the most important infrastructure is the legal infrastructure. So having to trust that whenever there's a problem, there's a conflict, uh, it's based on contracts and it's based on contractual law, commercial law, as you use it in the international sphere, which means uh, where it's not, uh, you're not evidently under a government, but it's between or co companies operating uh, between uh, nations. Uh, so there's a lot of precedents there. I think that's the most important infrastructure, but then of course you'll have practical infrastructure and that depends on the location. Usually, uh, uh, some of those and the more interesting ones are greenfield projects, which means you have to bring kind of port infrastructure, street infrastructure, uh, and then, of course, build based upon that with a kind of market-based urbanism, uh, which will be more independent for con contractual uh, residential areas where there's something to be learned from the gated communities industry, uh, but not in the sense that you have like gated communities within dysfunctional areas, but you have contractual arrangements of people uh, co-owning or uh, having leases. Uh, and there are all kinds of different arrangements which are already in place and which you don't have to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, find new solutions to everything. Uh, uh, so we think you have like uh, uh, people who are more closely aligned in certain preferences. And then we think it's also part of the legal infrastructure where if you are free to innovate without r regulations already there, which are dysfunctional, it'll be a lot about negotiating aspects of rights uh, where you can handle the external externalities problem really well, uh, the problem of aesthetic conformity versus uh, freedom. Uh, we think that the current solutions in zoning and so on are terribly dysfunctional and they don't really fulfill the functions that they may have uh, or may have had in the past. Uh, uh, so we think that the better approach is having the right infrastructure for the settlers and investors to really have very uh, um, a very finely and, and diversified uh, way to deal with each other and to pay off people for certain rights and to buy certain rights and that a lot of conflicts uh, that uh, usually created by politics would disappear right there. But of course, you'll always have conflicts and that's why this legal framework maybe is the most important one. Uh, and it's certainly not about uh, specifying uh, every square centimeter of how it's got to be used but leaving up a lot to the uh, spon spontaneous order and emergent order of people figuring out how they want to live and, and the trade-offs, uh, and there will always be trade-offs. Uh, and so we expect to have quite a diversity within a zone, a diversity. So it's like, like uh, uh, special zones or village-like structures within a more city-like urban development, uh, uh, things that may rather look like intentional communities. So there's also a trade-off. How much alignment do you want to have uh, with the people you live uh, uh, close uh, to each other. Um, and uh, we expect that you'll have some communities which are very, very uh, closely aligned, uh, where you even have the same aesthetic preferences. And then you'll have zones which are very pragmatic and, and uh, uh, leave a lot open and have a more look a little bit more chaotic in a sense, they look more spontaneous. And we think that's fine that people should be free to experiment uh, uh, on those ways. And there are much more functional, uh, we think, solutions if you open up that space uh, to the kind of experimentations that we're used to in entrepreneurship in the, in, in the, in the good sense. Mm -hmm. So you have optionality, diversity of 
I love that you can pay for aesthetics. I would pay for aesthetics if I can. Yeah. Uh, and the, the urban sprawl or the suburban sprawl, excuse me, suburban sprawl here in the United States, the, the strip malls, the plastic houses, the just cookie cutter fashion of it all across the country is, is nauseating and, and it's very high time preference, right? The building materials. Yes. Are always yes. Great. You're, you're gonna it's have... an important point. So we don't think that the current kind of urban development is a market result. We think it's the result of very distorted markets with dysfunctional regulation, most dysfunctional zoning combined with a very bad financial infrastructure that leads to the hoarding of real estate uh, uh, for lack of better investment opportunities. Uh, and uh, really, to a certain extent, Bitcoin fixes some of that problem or could fix some of that problem. Uh, and of course, a short time preference, uh, uh, which is one of the main results of the distortion of the monetary system and by financial order. Uh, so we think a lot of the faults in current urban developments are really based on bad legal framework and ba bad financial framework. And, and the bad financial framework is addressed by Bitcoin and the bad legal framework is addressed by free private cities. So let's lean into like how quickly these changes can can happen if if citizens opt into something like a free private city. Again, you mentioned Emirates, Singapore, one generation yeah. from fishing cities to global capital uh, capital capitals of the world, if you will, financial capitals of the world uh, to some extent. Uh, and, and maybe that's a like a problem a lot of people, particularly in the West, have today is they. They see something like going and starting a free private city and they just think it's too arduous. It's it's too daunting of a task to overcome. And it seems impossible. And it's like, we have all this, like what happens to all this? Like how, uh, and we just let it decay and then we move on. Like what is the optimistic pitch for somebody being able to turn around a city and, and, and have a booming, uh, bustling uh, city that is actually aesthetically pleasing and an economic powerhouse? Uh, we know from history how amazingly quick uh, change can be once you have role models and once you use, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the feedback loops of technology, of uh, well-invested capital uh, and so on. But still in a short-term preference world, those projects are very long-term and too long-term for most people. So I get the point. Still, I'm optimistic. Uh, first, I expect the speed of change to increase over time uh, and uh, things look like uh, things are speeding up and second it's not a binary thing it's not a, a zero one thing really because a lot of progress has already been made and it's a gradual thing and uh, uh, some of the projects may start very small and they have already started and they may end up small but we don't know which of these projects will scale either because they are just role models uh, so or they make other people more optimistic about their endeavors because they figure out wow if something that small worked out in the end uh, uh, imagine what could be done if we increase the scale a bit so uh, I, that makes me optimistic but still of course it's it's long term it's a long term project that's why it doesn't really fit well into the current financial system I'd say uh, uh, it's uh, still it's possible to calculate returns uh, and mostly use real estate, and that's I bit it's a bit of a compromise, I'd say. I don't like the real estate game, uh, but the best way to, in a pragmatic way, to make sense of those kind of projects business-wise. The most short-term returns, of course, are in real estate, where you have, you'd say, where there's a kind of downside protection because real estate will continue to be hoarded uh, over the next decades, probably. So you can still, even if there's no development, you still have a real estate and you can sell it. Uh, and there's a kind of downside protection. But the upside, of course, it's big because if the real estate becomes more attractive, uh, because it becomes part of a hub because you have this kind of industrial development uh, there, uh, then uh, that makes sense even for, um, I'd say, I mean, common financial guys. Uh, uh, but uh, I think the better case for it is even more long term. And uh, uh, But I think that a growing minority of people are getting that more long term vision and are able to grasp it even without the short term real estate play behind it. And uh, can act as pioneers where you say, okay, it may turn out that I'm too early, uh, 
but uh, uh, there I think uh, Bitcoin is the best case for optimism that within a decade uh, even it can go from something very fringe and, and uh, uh, very hard to sell to anyone uh, to something that really becomes an important asset uh, and something that the mainstream has to write about and there's no way you can ignore it. Uh, and uh, so I, I think the speed increases because uh, we are connected and will be hopefully even better connected around the globe and thus the cycles of learning from failures even and trying out something new and scaling it because people all around the globe can see a solution and can change their behavior and can change their mindset, even if it's just having hope for alternative things, for pioneering, for going the other way, uh, trying out something new, then still that could mean a lot of impact. Uh, so I think it makes sense to be optimistic, but of course, one need to bear in mind that within our short-term incentives right now, those are more difficult, more long-term games. But in themselves, I think there's a lot of fun in being a pioneer. And then, I mean, look at, at the alternative. Uh, you can still, of course, uh, run in the hamster wheel uh, of the current systems. Uh, um, so I, you also, also look on the downside. I mean, how much is there to lose? Uh, um, I, it's, it's not for everyone to go all in now. I, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, to a guy who has a family and so on to just sell everything and move to uh, some uh, new uh, uh, project. Uh, but some are pioneers and for some it makes sense uh, because there's not too much to lose and, and it's much easier nowadays. It's basically a plane ticket and if it doesn't work out, you, you'll find a way back uh, uh, as well. So it's not like settling the West in, in, in the US, although the world is different. Uh, and people are looking for those challenges and uh, so I, that, that makes me pretty optimistic. Yeah, and you got to figure these pioneers too. They probably are willing, to, like you mentioned, willing to stomach lower returns because they want this to happen. Yeah, I think because it's, it's an end in itself. I, I'd say it's fun. Uh, it's it's uh, meeting uh, great, interesting people, entrepreneurial people, uh, and it's, it's the, the ride is fun in itself. And and that I think is is enough value to to try it out. So, do you think? In the future, if these free private cities are successful and the model's replicable and people around the world, like you said, it gets to a point where it's undeniable you can't not report on it and people are beginning to, to realize the benefits of this. Does the model get exported to uh, like whole communities that are already in place, like the island I'm on right now? Could it be imported here, um, hypothetically? Yes, uh, definitely, because it's not a utopian new project. It's rather bringing back from the past what has been been in place before the nation state had it's uh, has become the military success story it's been uh, and then of course the more imperial like structure uh with, with the american world order i mean nothing against the us i uh, uh, I, I love americans and then how they uh, uh, help european culture survive as well uh, but uh, of course uh, we all know that it won't be forever that, uh, and we're already developing into a new world order. We don't know if it'll be better. Something certainly will be worse uh, uh, with the US withdrawing from its role as, as arbiter of, of, of worldwide peace. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think it, it wasn't sustainable uh, in the first place and in the interesting times. And uh, we'll, there'll be a need. So it's not just the utopian ideas of how could it be. I mean, it's not like you have something working very well and you propose something untried I'm tested, very utopian. It's you have something that's working worse and and and, and worse uh, every year, and and you have a failure of an international structure, of a financial structure as well. And people are seeking alternatives, if you like it or not. Uh, and we've seen in the past that the tried and tested approach, which brought most wealth and most development, which happened mostly in Western Europe before, was the model of the autonomous city. Because there you have skin in the game. It's the merchants really who benefit from the city, who take, uh, who bear the cost of the decisions of the city and that space. Uh, and it turned to be a quite successful model. Uh, and, and it was mainly for military reasons and reasons of the... Uh, world order, the shaping world order with those nation states uh, in a new say, imperial arrangement that has replaced uh, those more uh, bottom-up structures that were there before.
never perfect, of course, and we, we are not romanticizing anything of the past, but it's not an entirely new model. So there'll be, if you like it or not, there'll be uh, new agents on uh, on the globe uh, uh, with new kinds of gradual sovereignties and, and distributed sovereignties and new challenges. Uh, uh, so I think it's best to grasp the challenge and to figure it out well uh, and, and to try uh, to, to find solutions and answers to that. And to the best answers usually are entrepreneurial answers where you try to really have, be transparent of what you try to achieve. You bear the cost if you fail and you offer it uh, to people. So I think it makes a lot of sense to go that way uh, instead of proposing a one-size-fits-all fits solution for a new global or order or a new world order. No, well, it's, it's great that we're getting live data and, and we're able to, to see this experiment played out in the wild today because it seems like the pendulum is at one end of the extreme right now. And the centralization of the political systems around the world seems to be getting to such a heavy point that it's, it's about to collapse. I mean, here in the last 18 months, the United States specifically, I've been saying this a lot recently in the last six months, particularly is the sovereign states exerting their autonomy from the federal government and running with different policies from state to state, as you mentioned, as we mentioned before we hit record, I'm moving to Texas because I, I, I like the way they're exerting their sovereignty in the face of this uh, encroaching federal control over individuals in the United States. And so it, it just seems like historically we're at a historical moment where the pendulum is at its extreme. It's about to swing the other way. And as it swings the other way, I think it's very uh, good that we have these models being played out. So it, it is easier to adopt as, as the pendulum begins to swing back. Yeah, even the increasing nationalism in Europe, of course, is a sign. Uh, it, it seems odd because nationalism was a centralizing force, but now it is in Europe is more a decentralizing reaction uh, against uh, uh, the effort of the European Union uh, and Germany and France uh, to somehow have a United States of Europe uh, uh, with a more centralized structure in place, which is dysfunctional and, and uh, uh, would work even uh, even worse uh, uh, in Europe than it's working in, in the US. So um, I totally agree. The pendulum is swinging back. Uh, we think it's best to use that momentum that's already there, uh, but it's better not to play the game of politics too much. It's not about secessions of ethnically homogeneous parts and, and, uh, and nations themselves. It's better to see it from a more small scale, more experimental ways of having zones where you are able to fail. Uh, and it's not because otherwise, and we've seen it in Europe, uh, uh, that way to the smaller nation states means meant a lot of ethnic cleansing. And nowadays it would be like cultural cleansing uh, where you, you'll have like people living in the cities, uh, very different mindsets and preference than the people living on the countryside. Uh, and it's like a, like a state of civil war uh, uh, that you'll have ongoing. So we think it's much better to either have like greenfield developments or have small scale zones and, and, and building up on this kind of special economic zones, free port uh, idea, uh, which makes it easier and, and, and uh, easier to handle as well. And it's not so much about who, who knows the truth and uh, uh, who gets to decide what to do. It's better, okay, where can we have the safety walls of uh, trying out new things? And if it don't work out, okay, it's not that bad. Uh, uh, it's not like a big failure where you have to punish those who pushed for going the other way and so on so within like the complex situations that we have in the complex politics i think it's best what i call a wall for safe, safety wall where pressure can um, go out and maybe be productive and and uh, put something into motion uh, that's working and then scales up because it's working not because you've convinced so many people uh, uh, not because you've convinced 51 percent to get rid of the other 49 percent uh, or something like that uh, so I think the best uh, change is coming from small projects, from tiny minorities to try out something that's working in a certain circumstance. Uh, well, I really like that framing. It's like, hey, let us try and fail, which is very different from, uh, I guess, libertarian movements. That, what was it, Liberland, where they bought some land uh, and they just like try to do it all at once. And you've been stressing that throughout this conversation as a gradual improvement it's not going to happen overnight it's going to be small methodical steps over time as people realize the benefits of what we're doing and i think that that sets you guys up for for a lot of successes hey 
this is an entrepreneurial endeavor. Let us try and fail. We'll, we'll eat the, the cost and the burden of that, which is much more upfront and transparent compared to, hey, we're going to buy a bunch of land in, in the middle of Europe and it's going to be the best thing ever. Like, yeah. Just come join us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, because a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of things enter the mix. Uh, so you have cultural things. Uh, uh, then you, of course, the question of infrastructure, of location, and so on. And every place is different. And we will have a bit of a different approach. Uh, we think there's one pattern to follow, which makes sense. But so, yeah, of course, we could learn that, no, that wasn't really the crucial thing, that there was something else. Uh, and we really have to figure out. And, and the most learning is done by trial and error. It's not, of course, you try because you want to fail. Uh, you try to be as best prepared as, pass, as possible and have the people who have bring most experience to it and build up on what's already tried and working in the past. Uh, uh, but still, every entrepreneurial effort, you'd be uh, clear about that most will fail. And I'm pretty sure that most of those projects will fail and have to fail. Uh, otherwise, something is not right <laughs> about it. Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, skin in the game. That's what I like. It's all in the game. It's like the most important thing, which, again, like you mentioned, the government has no skin in the game. They can go spend $2 trillion over two decades in Afghanistan and have literally nothing to show for it. Yeah. Um, no repercussions. It's it's very infuriating. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of infuriating things. Again, the government, again, we mentioned lockdown. I noticed your, I, this is something I wanted to touch on. It's, it's sort of tangential. To the free cities conversation, I noticed your bio. You're you're a nuclear physicist as well. You have background. What, what do you what do you think? Uh, it's something I've been very passionate about recently. Is the decommissioning of nuclear power plants around the world? It seems completely nonsensical to me as as a nuclear physicist. What what do you have to say about this particular topic? I, I think that's been a moral hysteria. hysteria. Uh, yeah, the hysteria. <laughs> How do you say that? Uh, which is not too dissimilar from the current COVID situation. So I. I think for some psychological reasons, there's some fear has um, passed on and it makes sense. Uh, I mean, it's, it's possible to understand that fear, uh, but it has been abused by the way politics works. Because uh, as I said before, pol- politics ba- is based on the premise that you have artificial certainty, that there is uh, some way you can like, have a certain result and you can avoid There's There are no trade-offs, basically. Uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, I'm. I think nuclear energy, uh, um, or I, I think we've stopped short of a nuclear age, which was really bad, <laughs> because that was one of the reasons. It was one of the developments which provided free and relatively safe energy, or, or cheap and relatively safe energy, and uh, more energy is behind a lot of innovation, which was making things possible, replacing human toil. Uh, and it's improving uh, the, the situation of life for most people. So I always thought it was a kind of moral hysteria. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's similar to COVID, if you actually like go and look at the data, and particularly the deaths per megawatt hour produced by nuclear energy compared to other energy sources, it's real, it's very low. It's very low on the list of actually being dangerous if that's that's what you're trying to measure yeah. by and stopping progress. Uh, and it's also similar in a sense that the interventions uh, that had to take place because there's a lot of uh, pressure on politics, in particular in old uh, democratic societies in the modern sense, where people really expect governments to provide a kind of certainty uh, for them, where you see in the, in the case of nuclear energy and, and the few uh, uh, situations of nuclear accidents, like in, in Fukushima, uh, fairly recently in Japan, you can really see the evidence is obvious that the cost in life of the interventions to keep people safe or protect them is much higher than uh, the direct health uh, impact uh, of those accidents. So, so of course, most people died due to, of, due to the floods uh, happening. And uh, of course, there is leakage and it's a very fairly well-known process of uh, that there's a health impact uh, of radiation, um, but uh, it's overestimated because it's hidden, it's secret. So there's a kind of, of instinctual, instinctive fear of people of, of uh, like being haunted by demons that could uh, attack you without seeing them. Uh, so that's closely related, I think, to the fear of, of viral contagion. And again, I, I think it's pretty obvious and you agree that, of course, there is a kind of contagion, of course, 
there are uh, potential health issues arising. Uh, and of course, it's not that nothing uh, is there. And uh, uh, But uh, I, I think we're seeing again that the interventions, uh, the cost of the interventions on human life is higher. Uh, not only how many babies have died, uh, though there are estimates out there to, to the COVID interventions. I think a few hundred thousand babies uh, have died all around the planet. As much more, of course, than have died to... Um, uh, to to, to uh, challenge uh, to their immune system uh, by this virus, which I think is real and and uh, might very well have leaked out of the Wuhan lab. Uh, uh, so I think there's something there, and and uh, but still I think that's that's uh, a lot of for politics. It seems like there's no alternative because a lot of people expect that kind of certainty, and if they don't see the cost of it, they expect that someone else is paying it, and they're just getting the benefit of being protected 100% of whatever a secret danger is lurking out there. Yeah, it's it's the inability of the masses to understand risk and, and yeah. accurately react to that risk. So the, the interventions in the economy particularly are, I think, very straightforwardly overreactions if you look at the data and understand the true risk of what's going on. I agree. Obviously, COVID exists. I do think it probably leaked from Wuhan as well. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just that miscalculation of risk leading to an overreaction that, that causes negative externalities that, that nobody thinks through. They don't think of the trade-offs. They don't understand the trade-offs. How could you understand the trade-offs? These things are extremely complex. You don't, you can't have all information at every point in time, which would give you the ability to make perfect decisions. Unfortunately, that's just not the way the world works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and our instincts are not very well geared for modern complex life in societies full of strangers, uh, billions of people cooperating, interacting. Uh, and really, our intuitions have been built and developed in an environment that was very, very different. Mm-hmm. All right, let's shift back. We'll, we'll wrap it up here. I have a question. Like, how can Bitcoin help free private cities? Like, do, do any of these free private cities start with the treasury that holds Bitcoin on the balance as, a, as, a, as an attempt to preserve wealth over time and potentially grow wealth significantly? Yes, yeah, so all the projects I'm uh, involved with, uh, for them, it's crucial to have uh, the infrastructure there should uh, bear in mind that Bitcoin is one of the most important or could be one of the most important assets uh, for our potential customers, which means people investing in a free private city, settling in a free private city, uh, which are usually people that are open to institutional innovation, uh, are usually uh, location independent in a certain sense that they are able to move or relocate. And for uh, those kind of people who try to address Bitcoin is becoming more and more important. Uh, so it'll be built up into the legal infrastructure as well. And there is no, uh, it makes no sense at all to have a legal tender, of course, in a free private city. We don't expect as a business model to use seniorage, uh, not even a kind of token model where you have a pre-mine or something like that. We don't think it makes sense in the long term. We really want to look at it that we are offering a service to people. We don't try to trick them. We uh, So it should be as transparent as possible. So don't bring in the financial uh, riggedness uh, uh, to, to fund something. It's really by providing a long-term service. And I think it's just the need of our potential customers is uh, how can I handle the situation that Bitcoin will be a relevant asset to me uh, as as well, a location independent alternative asset uh, that uh, for which the case becomes the more important, the more top down uh, imposing and and interventions are happening around the globe. And it's very similar to the need for free private cities and alternative jurisdictions to say say that way. So that there's a, a, a very natural match between the kind of alternative assets of Bitcoin and alternative jurisdictions of free private cities. And as I said, Bitcoin is a very important role model. I think it's it's the main reason that something as, it seems as crazy as the free private city project has become feasible and and it's not just crazy fringe people uh, who, uh, I mean, have have dreams and um, uh, uh, it's really people who've made money, who are successful, who are entrepreneurs, 
who are willing to consider those kind of alternatives and that makes it much more realistic. Uh, so it's not just some libertarian pipe dream and stuff like that. We've surpassed uh, 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 that uh, level uh, already. Uh, so there's a lot of serious interest and, and serious investment interest there in, in getting those things uh, working. So if my listeners, many Bitcoiners, uh, are interested in, in learning more about free private cities and potentially investing and moving to a free private city, what, what can they do? Where can they go? How can they begin to get involved if, if they're interested in this? Freeprivatecities.com. Uh, that's the Swiss foundation. So we try to be the neutral uh, place that uh, uh, keeps well informed about all the different projects. Uh, we are a bit closely related to uh, a more entrepreneurial branch, which is uh, doing the negotiations and preparing the ground and, and uh, starting the operating companies as well. But the foundation itself uh, is distinct from the entrepreneurial arm. And the foundation is there to inform in a neutral way, to pass on the idea and to help people make sound investments uh, in the field by uh, knowing the different projects, knowing the trade-offs of different approaches as well. So everyone who's interested, go to freeprivatecities.com, uh, uh, look at what's what's on the site, subscribe to our newsletter, or just send us an email uh, if you have a more specific inquiry or interest already, and we try to figure out how the foundation can help you uh, being part of that very exciting space and I think most exciting industry of our lifetime. Yeah, it's infinitely fascinating, and thank you. For, for working on it and being passionate about it and educating people about it. Because again, I think it's imperative as the governments of the world become hyper-centralized and, and try to act in a coordinated fashion to control the global economy. I think having free private cities, city, uh, free private cities is uh, actually imperative if we want freedom in the digital age. And so, freaks, if you're interested, go check it out. Raheem, thank you for your time. Again, I'm sorry for the, for the reschedule at the last minute. Oh, right. week. But uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. I think you're going to crush it. It's an incredible idea. Like, and, I, and as as we said, the pendulum seems to be beginning to swing back. So the, the momentum, I think, is only going to cont continue to grow from here. Definitely. Thanks a lot. I greatly enjoyed talking to you. Greetings yeah. from Vienna. <laughs> well, go enjoy your night. Thank you uh, for joining yes. us. That's all we have today, freaks. Peace and love. Thank you.